Hello, everybody. This is Jeff Michaels. I just wanted to come to you and uh, let you know a little bit about what happened this last Sunday. I know not everybody can make it to every one of our worship gatherings, and so if you missed last Sunday, I wanted to make sure you didn't totally miss out because we covered some really interesting things. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do these recaps all the time, but uh, we're going to see how it goes. Anyway, I want to just let you in on the fact that this series we've been on has been really interesting to me. It's been an exciting time for me personally, and I've been learning a lot as well. And this last week was no exception to that. Now, we're in this series called Real Proof. And in this series, the idea is that we're trying to address not just the proof that we think we want when it comes to matters of faith and, and believing in God and, and things like that, but the kind of proof that we really need. And there's a book in the Bible that addresses that directly. Uh, it's the book of John. And in John's gospel, he even tells us these words, John 20, 30 through 31. It says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so we're in this series because John is the book that deals with doubt more than any other book. And in this book, uh, he directly addresses doubt by saying, hey, the reason I'm putting these stories down is so that you would believe. There are lots of things that Jesus did, but these stories are to help you actually believe. And so that's one of the reasons why we're looking at it. And we're going to be going over it for the next few weeks as well. And I want to make sure that you make it a point to connect with us at least once a week, whether it's through this video podcast or by going to a core group or doing a Sunday morning worship gathering or all of the above. Connect with us once a week, all the way up to and through Easter, and you will be encouraged by this series that we're in. Now, just to review, last week, the previous week, we uh, talked about Jesus turning water into wine, and I asked the question, would that have been enough to convince you? And of course, the answer is probably no, because all of us, you know, we can find ways of re-explaining things, and maybe even the people in Jesus' day could find ways of re-explaining things, and so maybe that wouldn't have been convincing, and John knows that. That's why he gives us the second sign. And when we come to this story in John chapter 4, Jesus has already been back down to Jerusalem once. He did some miracles down there, but John doesn't record them. Jesus comes back up to Galilee, passing through Samaria on the way. He meets a woman at a well, and the entire town there ends up believing in Jesus. And now he's back up in Galilee. And we read this story on Sunday, and as I read it, I just went through it pretty quickly. But... Um, after I read it, I challenged everybody in the room that the way I had just read it was actually probably not the way you want to read the Bible. As a matter of fact, it's the way we usually read the Bible, where you just read a section, you say, oh, that's nice, and then you move on. Then there's another way of reading the Bible, in fact, two ways, and the second way of reading the Bible is to say, man, I'm already familiar with this stuff, but uh, it's, been a, uh, it's been a long time, I've learned it a long time ago, so I'll just move on. Um, but I don't want to move on because too many people have told me that every time they read the Bible, they get something new out of it. So that means there must be something here that I haven't seen before. And this is what actually happens. Eventually, Christians usually, people who are familiar with the Bible, will start looking for meaning that's not there. As a matter of fact, there's a way that you could read this passage also and get some meaning that just frankly isn't there. But there's a better way of reading the Bible. It's easier, it's simpler, it's straightforward, and it's a, it's a technique that we've forgotten. It's simply this. When you read the Bible, you need to pay attention to what's actually there. And so what I want to do is I want to read through this story with you, and I'm just going to highlight a few of the things that are actually there. And as I highlight these things, just jot them down and Take note of them, and then we're going to ask some questions later on to try to figure out, you know, what it's actually all about. So here's the passage, John 4, 45 through 54. When Jesus arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they'd also been there. 
Once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. Now here's just some things that I think you should write down. Observations, what's actually in the text. Number one, the Galileans welcomed Jesus because they saw miracles. They were down in Jerusalem. Jesus did miracles there. They saw some miracles there, and they welcomed him because of it. Number two, a royal official traveled from Capernaum to Cana to meet Jesus. Now, that's about 30 miles. So a royal official traveled over 30 miles to beg Jesus to come and heal his son. That's important. He's a royal official, which means he's a pretty important guy. He traveled 30 miles, which means he's going way out of his way, because of course back then, traveling 30 miles would take you about a day. And so he's traveling 30 miles. That's a pretty significant trek, pretty significant commitment. And he's begging Jesus to come and heal his son. That's important, to come and heal his son. Jesus says, unless you see miracles, you won't believe. Now, that kind of seems insensitive. Because this man didn't ask a question about belief. He didn't say, Jesus, do some miracles so I could believe. He said, Jesus, my son is dying. Would you heal him? And Jesus turns the tables. He says, unless you see miracles, you won't believe. It sounds insensitive, but just go ahead and write it down. Make the observation, put it down. Maybe we'll make some sense of it later. The next thing we see is that Jesus says to the man, you may go. Your son will live. Now, that also seems a little bit insensitive. Because after all, the man said he wanted Jesus to come to his house. He traveled 30 miles. Jesus, come and heal my son. And Jesus says, no, go. He'll be all right. Your son will live. What's interesting, though, is that then the man takes Jesus at his word and leaves. And the last thing that we should recognize from the story is that uh, the son recovers and the whole family believes. Now, just like any investigative reporter or crime show, what we're going to do now is we're going to ask some questions to try to help understand this. And the first question we want to ask is, what did the man believe and when? Because as a matter of fact, the passage tells us he believes at the end. But earlier on in the story, Jesus said, go, your son will live. And the man, we read, takes Jesus at his word. Now, that's interesting. It means the man somehow had to have some type of faith that Jesus was telling him the truth. And what's, in, what's in, in fact the most interesting is that this man had to believe in something without seeing it. See, Jesus said, go, your son will live. The man had to accept Jesus at his word. He had to somehow believe in Jesus' words without actually seeing anything about it. That's interesting. But it does raise the question for us that is it belief in Jesus to believe what he says, or are they different? In fact, what we learned on Sunday was that accepting Jesus, what he says, is only the start of believing in who he is. And remember, John's gospel doesn't care about us believing all the details of what Jesus says. The point of John's gospel is that we would believe he is someone, that he is the Savior of the world, the Son of God, and that by believing we can have life in his name. Yeah, John wants us to understand what Jesus said, but it's more important for John to understand who Jesus is and for us to accept it and believe it. This man early on believes what Jesus said, and then only later on does he believe in who Jesus is. But it does make us think about the details of what Jesus said. Because see, the second thing Jesus said was, your son will live. The first thing Jesus said was that somewhat insensitive statement. Unless you people see signs and wonders, 
you will never believe. Is that true? I mean, is it true for you? As a matter of fact, when Jesus says that, his insensitivity should cause our blood to boil just a little bit. Jesus, what do you mean? Unless these people see signs and wonders, they won't believe. In fact, let me ask you one more question to try to help us unpack all the stuff that we've seen so far. Did anyone see this miracle? Did anyone see this miracle? Jesus didn't. The man didn't. He was on the road when he found out his son was better. His son didn't. His son was sick, and then he started getting better, so it's not like he necessarily knew a miracle, because lots of times when people are sick, they just get better. The people around him didn't see it as a miracle, because Jesus hadn't said anything right there. You know, he was 30 miles away from where Jesus was. No one saw this miracle, and that's why this is so fascinating that Jesus would have said Unless you see miracles, you won't believe. See, as a matter of fact, I think Jesus is doing some reverse psychology here. He says, he says something insensitive because he wants us to react against it. He says, unless you see something, you won't believe. He wants us to say, oh no, that's not, that's not true. I can believe without seeing. And then Jesus does an invisible miracle. It's pretty cool. Because as a result of that invisible miracle... This man and his whole family believes. And because of Jesus' statement in the middle, we get to ask ourselves this question. If an unspiritual father can believe in Jesus because of an unseen miracle, can I? See, that's the real point of the story. Do I need to see to believe? Am I one of those people who has to see in order to believe? Or, for me, is belief something else? For this man, belief came when he took Jesus at his word first, and then something happened later, and he put the pieces together, and that's when he believed. He never actually saw a miracle. He just had to put some pieces together. And I believe that same thing is going to work for you too. You, know, you need to pay attention to what Jesus says, but at some later point in time, something might happen that you won't see as a miracle unless you've paid attention to what Jesus said. Unless you've spent some time hanging out with him, listening to him, taking him at his word, whatever it might be. But the point of this whole story isn't, do you believe? It's just this simple question. Do I need to see in order to believe? And so I want to leave you with that question too. Think about it yourself. Spend some time actually wrestling with this. Do I need to see to believe? And then make your way to one of our core groups this week and interact with someone else. Or find someone else that you know and, and act, ask them the discussion questions we have for today. I mean, the simple discussion questions that we're doing through this whole series are basically these four. What do I learn about Jesus? What do I learn about people? What do I learn about myself? And who do I know who needs to hear this? Take some time this week. Interact with these thoughts. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. Send me a Twitter feed, something or other. And uh, hit me up on Facebook, anything like that. I'd love to be able to interact with you on some of this stuff, but even better, find someone in your life near you that you can ask these questions of, that you can talk about this story with, that you can interact with, and, and come to a realization. Maybe, maybe we don't need to see to believe. Maybe belief needs to be based on something else. God bless you all. Thanks for watching.